So the strike team, um, our goal is to protect natural lands and, you know, through coordinated invasive species management. And, um, you know, I think that's a key. We sort of are acting like the hub of information um, in New Jersey. So we do a lot of mapping and reporting. We do a lot of training uh, workshops, outreach events. And, you know, of course we, we do the actual work of searching for and eradicating invasive species. We do tend to focus on what's called early detection rapid response. Um, so that's an, an attempt to reduce the spread of new invaders. Mm -hmm. So this is who we are. Um, it's a it's a large group uh, of staff. We're all very part time. We basically are um, mostly our most of our funding comes from grants and contracts, and um, we have a statewide steering committee that helps guide us. And we also have a technical advisory committee, which is absolutely vital for. Uh, interpreting um, information and listing species of, of all taxa. So it's not just plants, it's fish, it's pests and pathogens, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this group is really gives a lot of um, strong credentials to the strike team because there's such a wide variety of expertise on our, on our technical committee. So what have we gotten done since we started in 2008? Um, so New Jersey is about 5 million acres. Uh, we've searched about 800,000 of them detected 25,000 populations and completed about 7,000 eradications. So, you know, obviously we can't, we can't keep up with the amount of detections, obviously, um, but we're, 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 we are slugging away and, and beating back invasive species. Um, very quickly, we have a U.S. Forest Service grant. Um, this allows us to work with uh, with the partners that you see at the bottom of the screen and, and also a lot of private landowners. And that's, you know, really critical for, um, you know, invasive species control in general. The more people that are, that are engaged, the better. Um, there's just a lot of bases to cover and, and we really need a, an active base of, of private landowners. Um, our contracts, we have a number of them. These are ones that are fairly long standing year after year. And then, of course, we do you know a lot of training and outreach. We're still sort of in the recovering from you know um, uh, the pandemic. Uh, we're probably not quite reaching as many people as before, but we're it's still a good amount of people that we're reaching in a good number of events every year. I definitely want to pause on this concept for a bit. Um, so this is a way for people to, to plug in. So what we were noticing is that there's these incredible um, groups of people that essentially adopt a park um, from the stewardship perspective. Uh, so they're just doing amazing work out there all for free. <laughs> and um, you know, if you're lucky enough to be a landowner um, that's receiving this help, uh, I'm sure you're happy with it. So there, there's a lot of groups. This, you know, maybe approaching two dozen groups, and um, you know, we we now have. Well, I'll, I'll skip to the next slide. So these are some of the things that the the groups that are most active have in common. So they have good communication with the landowner. Obviously, you can't do anything on property that you don't own without permission. Um, there's one to three group core members and about 10 to 15 available volunteers. They have predictable work days. So day of week, time of day is repeated often. So the core might show up, someone from the core will show up every single time. And then whoever's available shows up, um, you know, from the pool of volunteers. And also important with invasives because you can get get lost very quickly in a sea of invasives and feel like you're not getting anything done. Um, so you know, very concise plans with with sort of checkbox doable items. So you take a bite, you chew. You take another bite, you chew, um, and you just sort of feel the progress bit by bit. Um, and uh, and then obviously you know, the invasive stuff, killing invasives is fun for me. Um, and lots of other people as well, but it's always good to sort of 
add the component of restoration, planting wildflowers, trees, et cetera, et cetera. So if you clear a, a, a bad patch of invasives, it's usually sort of seals the deal on people feeling good about things when you can kind of do a little bit of restoration as well. So if on our website, um, we have a, a Google map, we have a listing of all the groups that we know of, and we have a Google map so you can kind of say, okay, this one's close to my house. Who's the leader? What do, what do I know about them? Can I get in touch with them? And then since it's on Google Maps, you can immediately say, oh, this is only 20 minutes from my house. I can do that group or it's, oh, that's an hour away. Maybe that's a little too far, but you get the gist. Um, you know, I strongly encourage people to volunteer. And if there's not a group near you, you know, maybe you want to be someone who starts up a new group. And obviously the, the, you know, the wild ones group, you know, is fully aware of all the great native things. And that's why, you know, I, have, I assume that's why I'm here tonight is to say, okay, what, what's something that's threatening all these things that we love. Um, so we got a lot of great things going on across the state, a lot of interesting plants, uh, 2000 native plants. Um, we have all kinds of, you know, uh, animal diversity as well. We have federally listed bog turtles. We have globally rare northern meadowmark butterflies, and we still got wild. You know, we have bobcats. We have timber rattlesnakes. We have black bears. So you know, there's a lot of great things that we need to um, need to make sure they continue to carry on, and uh, let's reduce the effects of invasives to help these guys out. In our overarching goals, we want healthy habitats. You know, we can't obviously manage each of those species one at a time. Um, so, you know, the idea, the overarching idea would be to have healthy habitats that aren't um, really susceptible to invasion. So just a little bit of, this is one of those great graphics um, um, that Rutgers came up with. And you can kind of see what's happened to New Jersey over time. You know, the development has been um, obviously very intense in lots of parts of New Jersey, but we're still just over half of our state is in natural cover. And um, but the impacts on those that half that remains gets the burden on them gets higher and higher as they get more and more surrounded by, um, you know, urban cover development. So yeah, I'm, I'm always never accused of being Mr. Happy. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of problems that we've created. You know, so the habitat destruction I mentioned, um, very much related, is overabundant deer. All that development has really helped the deer population skyrocket. It's not a matter of taking a an amount of deer and then squeezing them into a smaller amount of natural land. As it turns out, doing all that development really feeds deer and protects them from hunting. So we have much more deer than we used to. Do. So back in 1972, I believe we had around 12 deer per square mile. Um, and now we have in many places over 100, maybe at best we have 50 or so deer per square mile. So five to 10 times more deer than what a forest can really handle. Um, and then invasive species have gone, increases have gone hand in glove with overabundant deer. Um, as they remove native species competitors. Um, there's a legacy of agricultural soil modifications um, that really lend themselves to being invaded as they become forests. Um, we've altered fire regimes. I mean, if you think, you know, back 500 years ago, um, you know, before, before Native Americans were getting severely impacted by diseases and such that Europeans were bringing over and, and all the other other unfortunate, horrible things. Um, the Native Americans were burning the landscape on a regular basis um, for thousands and thousands of years before the Europeans got here. And all of our systems adapted to that, to that fire regime. And of course, there were natural large wildfires as well. So that sort of came to an end roughly 500 years ago, um, but the effects are still here. Um, the, the lack of fire is, uh, you know, many of our landscapes are starving essentially for fire. 
uh, altered stream flows, fragmentation, and you know, you know, you're in trouble when when you've gone over a whole long list of bad things, and then you get to climate change. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of challenges. So as far as in bases, what what are what, what are we talking about? What's the sort of universe of numbers here? So you know, there's about estimated to be about 10,000 non-native plant introductions. About one tenth, ten, uh, a thousand are part of our flora. They reproduce on their own, so they were introduced by humans. They were brought here um, either purposely or accidentally, and they've established on their own so that human intervention isn't required to keep them going anymore. And most of these are very insignificant weeds. Um, so, you know, when you're getting down out of that thousand, there's about 50 widespread invasives and about 100 emerging invasive species. So, you know, we're talking about 150 out of the original 10,000 non-native plants that are either widespread or threatening to become widespread. And, you know, this is pretty basic, but, you know, an invasive plant, it's introduced to an area outside of its range and it grows densely and excludes other species. And then once you've done that, you've, you've dramatically changed um, the, the community. Um, and since we have a very overabundant deer population, one of the sort of screens of a non-native plant going from just there to becoming invasive is if deer don't eat them, that's a huge advantage, um, especially if they're eating the great majority of native plants that might compete with them. So you're basically not a better competitor, you're just less yummy. Um, and then the weed characteristics. So they tolerate a wide variety of soil types and light levels. They mature quickly and produce lots of seeds. So that the bottom three are your typical, what, what are the qualities of a weed, um, but, there's a strong filter in New Jersey and lots of other places where overabundant deer are the most, if you don't get eaten by deer, when deer are overabundant, that's a huge advantage for you. So why are they bad? Um, so when agricultural fields are abandoned, um, you know, even 30, maybe 50 years ago, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you'd get an amazing habitat. You can get, you know, all these species in yellow here and then some, this is only a subset. So you'd have this huge diversity of species that would take open an open area um, as it ultimately developed into a forest. <clears throat> and you would get different species making, having fruit and seeds and flowers available throughout the entire calendar year. And if you're um, a bird that needs to eat fruit, for example, well, you probably don't want any months where there's nothing available for you to eat, right? That would be pretty, pretty hard. Um, but what's happening now is, you know, a single species like autumn olive can take over the entire field, virtually uh, forming a monoculture. And all that diverse fruit, flowers, and seeds goes away and gets replaced with one plant that has flowers at one time of year in May or maybe it has fruit in the month or two of the year, you know, but that's really not good enough. And, and the other problem with most invasives is not only do deer not eat them, but bugs aren't eating their leaves. If bugs aren't eating, the bugs aren't, uh, populations aren't being supported by eating leaves of plants, then what are the birds eating when they need bugs to feed their, feed their chicks? So, you know, we're having this wet food web just completely being shattered um, by invasive species and to the detriment of, of lots of things. So there's studies that are out that say 30% um, of our bird population, the overall bird population has gone away in the last 50 years. Um, similarly, huge amounts of, of insect populations have vanished in that same time frame. So, you know, we're watching, um, you know, a really dramatic uh, breakdown, ecological breakdown, uh, with losses uh, mounting. And obviously, like a few slides back, there are multiple reasons for that, but it would be very hard to deny that invasives are not a very significant part of the problem. So here's a little bit more. Again, the timing isn't a coincidence with deer. So the estimates before European settlement were 10 per square mile. Back in 72, there were 
around 10 per square mile. And when you get, you know, into 2020 range, you're getting over 100 deer per square mile in certain parts of the state and maybe at best 50 deer per square mile in the least abundant deer areas. So, you know, you get the gist of the size of the bars. There's, it's way more deer than there ever were and our forests can't really take it. Um, now, if you think about it from the, the invasive species timing, you know, if you read historical botanical surveys and things like that, there's almost no mention of invasive species until about the 50s. And it, even then, it was mostly just Japanese honeysuckle that people were, were seeing as invasive. Um, you know, if you think about things that we think of as very widespread now and that they've always been here, stiltgrass and barberry didn't really start kicking off until the 80s. You know, so, you know, that might seem like a decent clip of time for a human, but for, for nature, that's, that's not even close to a blink of an eye. Things are changing extremely quickly. Um, and those food webs are being broken and we're losing, we're losing stuff. Um, so, you know, again, there's a definite timing coincidence between deer overabundance and invasive species proliferation. So yeah, these is just some numbers from uh, Hopewell in Mercer County where I do a lot of work. Um, there was a bit of a drop in the deer population in 2022 because there was a blue tongue EHD outbreak. Uh, unfortunately in 2023, when we did it, we were back up to 90 already in one year. They went from 70 to 90 deer per square mile. So they rebound, they rebound very quickly. And the, in 2012, that's it was a very severe outbreak of blue tongue. And it took, you know, two, two years to get back up to 80 something. And then, you know, four years they were back over hundred again. So these disease outbreaks come and go, they temporarily knock down the population size, but it, it rebounds extremely quickly. Um, so again, the historic estimates are 10 deer per square mile. Um, different things in the literature come to that same number magically, interestingly. Lyme disease cycle could be broken at 10 deer per square mile. Deer vehicle collisions dramatically drop and, and forest um, health uh, has been shown to start degrading above 10 deer per square mile. So again, you can imagine what 100 deer square, per square mile does to a forest. And this is the general gist. Again, this is Hopewell, the greenest forests. Um, so there's some big pieces of forest left, but a lot of it is fragmented and it really is perfect deer habitat. Um, the tan areas are farm fields and um, development, you know, housing developments and things like that. So, you know, they're as happy as a clam. They're living in a salad bowl. And for the most part, you know, hunting can't get to a lot of the deer. So it's something like 40 40 plus percent of the land in Hopewell isn't hunted. Um, some of that is just choice of the landowner. And a lot of that is there, you just can't hunt because there's too many homes around. So, um, you know, we create perfect deer habitat. We don't have sufficient deer management. And then we get all of these problems. You know, so in, in Hopewell, you could have upwards of 500 um, deer vehicle collisions a year in one area that's 40,000 acres. So it's huge losses for people as far as uh, insurance and things like that. And, you know, this is what's happening in our forests. So yeah, forests and forest trees fall down. You know, they get a disease or they get hit by lightning or whatever. And back in the old days, there used to be in the understory of the forest, there used to be small trees that could be there. You know, they could be five foot tall and 30 years old. Um, because they were in the shade, they couldn't grow well, but there weren't so many deer that it didn't matter that you were only four feet tall because uh, there was not so many deer that would eat you. So when a canopy gap opened, you were a little tree that was pretty old, you pop right up. You have a great root system, you pop right up into the canopy and, and restore that uh, gap in the forest. Now we have only thing in the understory is invasive plants, in many cases invasive plants that deer don't eat. Um, and when the canopy opens, those invasive species go bonkers and you don't get new trees, you get more invasives. 
And when you look on the ground in these same forests, you know, you can find little seedlings of natives struggling along, spice bush and tulip poplar, um, but they don't have a chance. They can't get, um, you know, away from the deer when they're that small and they, they're never allowed to get big. So the bones are there, those, all those mature trees and larger shrubs are throwing off seeds and fruit and making new seedlings, but they don't go anywhere because the deer stop that from happening. So these are the things that would be the competition for invasive species in the understory, but they get selectively eaten by deer. So in a lot of forests, you know, we want this. This is what a forest should be looking like. Um, some forests have absolutely nothing. Where there was never any agricultural land use, you get bare forests, just empty. Where you've had agricultural land use, you get the worst case scenario where you get just a tangle of weeds and vines and literally you could watch the forest crumble. Um, and we're seeing the many, many instances that look like this now as the emerald ash borer has, is, is finishing off all the ash trees in the state. So, like I said, we try to focus on emerging invasives. Um, <clears throat> we have, we're going to do our 2023 review at the end of the month. So these are still the 2022 numbers, but we had 99 emerging plants and 45 emerging animals. And that could be anything from a microorganism up to a mammal. Um, and what we do too, to help prioritize is we say, okay, out of the emerging, out of emerging invasive species, we have these stages. So stage zero would be um, less than 10 known populations in the state. Stage one would be 10 to 100 populations in the state, and you get the gist. So when we put out our list, we, we basically say, if you have something on your property that's a stage zero species, that has to be your number one priority. You don't go after the big woolly infestation of barberry first. First, you go for the truly emerging invasive species and keep them from expanding their populations. So a lot of stewardship, you know, you can't undo a lot of the things that you see, but you can prevent future damage by knowing what poses a threat um, that hasn't fully expressed itself yet. So you go after these early stage species first, then you work your way up to um, your widespread species. So a stage zero example is um, one of them is sickleweed. And this is sort of a, a happy story. Um, so the strike team exists, people know it, botanists know it. So bot someone sees this plant called sickleweed at White Lake in Warren County, which is about 20 minutes from my house. So he says, I found this plant, I think it's sickleweed. What do you think? And I'm like, man, I've never heard of sickleweed in all my life. Um, so, you know, you look it up, you find out it's a, uh, a big pest in range, uh, rangeland, um, and, um, open habitats from the Midwest to the West. And you say, okay, well, let's kill it. Let's get rid of it. Why would we wait? You know, so I went out there and I sprayed it. Um, I followed up the next year, did a little bit of more spraying and I've been there periodically from, you know, multiple years. It's gone. Now, what if I hadn't done that? What if the strike team hadn't existed? There was no one to tell. The person might just say, well, that's interesting. And it would just keep going and going, you know, end up taking you over the whole site, end up spreading to other sites and getting to be a widespread species, um, causing massive amounts of damage. So, you know, early detection, rapid response. You see something that looks like it's going to be a problem. You put an end to it before it proves that it's going to be a problem using information that you know about it from other places. So again, that, that is sort of the ideal example of what the strike team does and what we want to encourage others to do. Let's get these emerging ones before they get bad. So, um, you know, now this was another case in, uh, in Hopewell, Lake Baldwin, beautiful wet meadow. One Chinese silver grass popped up. Well, we know that it could do this. So why would we wait? 
you know, we went out there and in a very short period of time killed one plant and now this habitat is preserved. Um, so, you know, preventing damage is definitely should be number one on the list for any stewards. We kind of went over this already, um, but the general idea is when you've had past land use, agricultural use and high deer abundance, that's where you get most of your invasives. When you have no past agricultural land use and low deer numbers, that's when you have the least amount of invasives and no, most amount of natives. Um, and in New Jersey, that typically will be places um, in the Northern Highlands, in particular, um, the Ridge and Valley section of New Jersey. So, you know, here's the hierarchy. I'm just more or less repeating myself, but number one is do whatever you can to reduce the deer population. Then you move to invasives, starting with the most um, emerging species and then moving onward. And then when you have the chance, restore. So, you know, I think, you know, for volunteer stewardship teams, you know, a lot of times maybe they can't do too much about deer because they're not the landowner, but they can certainly carry that message to the landowner. And then they could work on, you know, the twos and threes uh, to make the land better. Um, so this is, I'll, I'll detour, and I'll just warn you that there's a number of slides coming up that are probably way too detailed to go into, or too many slides, I should say, to go into today. But I can give this presentation, um, and folks want it as a resource, they could look through in more detail every slide, and they could always contact me anytime. But Duke Farms has um, um, they've been they have the best deer management program in the state. They have 2,700 acres. They're in Central Jersey, Hillsborough, and um, they have a, a one square mile deer exclosure, and then they have areas outside where they're doing the deer management. And it it just the one of the most degraded sites that could be imagined initially, and still has problems. But you know they had 250 deer per square mile at one point, so it's just outrageous amounts of deer. They just completely stripped every bit of uh, edible vegetation was gone. Um, you know 20 years ago. And I've been working with them and measuring forest health, yada, yada. Um, this is something that a st statistics um, a professor at Rutgers did, so don't ask me. Um, the, den the, the, the idea that I wanna come across here is that a way that maybe we could start thinking about this problem. You know, So we're not going back to 1492. We're, we're going to have forests that are much more degraded than they were in 1492 for as long, as far out as the eye could see. So what is the goal then? The goal is to make it better. You know, it isn't to make it perfect, it's to make it better. So if you think about better as being more native species relative to non-native species, you can just simply say, what's the ratio? When you measure the deer understory, what's the ratio of native to non-native cover? So in, within the deer exclosure, it was about, a little bit more native cover than non-native cover. You know, one to one would be the same. It was 1.1 to one. After only, you know, 15 years, I guess, it was 1.4, you know, native to non-native cover. I know numbers, they're small. The, maybe you can't see the drama there, but when you're out there looking at it, you see the drama. <laughs> the native plants are doing incredibly well responding to that either being exclosed from deer or even just the hunting program outside, you know, they're making a comeback. When you make it a more of a fair fight, you could see how competitive the native species are. And, you know, I think, you know, just that element of fairness, that fair fight concept, that that just really resonates with me personally, is just make it fair and see what happens. Um, and what happens is native plants start coming back. And just some examples, look at all these beautiful maple hickory seedlings coming up in a forest, you know, you just virtually absent in most of New Jersey. Um, just absolutely amazing to see it. And, you know, maybe you shouldn't be surprised. Nature never forgets how to work. We just have to get out of our way. Um, and when we get out of our way, all of a sudden things start getting better. Um, 
you know, Japanese still grass, right? Well, you can't grow, and nothing would ever grow through dense Japanese still grass. Well, it turns out hickory seedlings can do really well when they're not getting eaten by deer. Um, and as these seedlings get bigger, the, the, inv the invasives get swallowed up. So here's a Where's Waldo of, you know, that's Japanese barberry right here, a little bit popping through, getting smothered by tree, native trees and shrubs that seedlings and saplings. So again, we, we have to start thinking about making it a fair fight primarily by lowering the deer number and then all of a sudden native plants will do our control work for us. Same here, this one's just a little bit clearer. So there's barberry down here just getting smothered by oak seedlings and ash seedlings and spice bush and things like that. You know, this is what, this is what the goal is to make things better. So there will be a lot of detail in this control methods. Again, I won't try to, um, you know, get every last de detail on from each slide, but I'll just go through them just to show you. So control, I mean, the first part of control is um, stop with you know, the, the old expression, you know, when you're in a hole, stop digging. Not buying more invasives and planting them in our yards would represent stopping digging. We're not gonna, that doesn't make the forest better, but it makes them, it, it makes the problem stop getting worse and worse by just planting new, new things that will spread into our forest. So we make a list, a do not plant list. We update it every year and we ask people to refrain from, voluntarily refrain from buying invasives. Um, so New Jersey is one of only a few states left in the country that has absolutely no regulation on the sale of invasive species. The good news is that appears to be on the, we seem to be on the cusp of that changing. Fingers crossed that it all goes through, uh, but Senator Smith and Greenstein have introduced a bill. I and a group of others, uh, along with the Nursery Trade and Department of Agriculture, DEP, um, Farm Bureau, State Board of Agriculture, you know, I think we're all relatively on the same page now, and it's just a matter of getting this bill across the finish line. And we really hope that that will happen uh, soon. Um, but it may turn out that we're, um, you know, finally, finally, after many years, uh, catching up with just about every other state in the country. And um, we'll still probably put out our lists, but there will actually be regulation on, on invasive species, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, in the near future. Um, so there's different types of um, control methods. You know, there's biological control, mechanical, chemical, cultural, ecological is what I've been talking about, where you reduce the deer uh, abundance and let native plants compete. Um, um, you know, I'll go through some of these, but um, you know, biological control is costly and you can do good things with it, but only a little bit at one species at a time over decades. You know, to be safe about biological control, it could take, you know, 20 years of research to get to that safe point. Um, mechanical control can work. Um, it's just a lot slower than using herbicides. Um, sometimes it's not effective at all and you just have to keep cutting and cutting, um, but you, you can make some progress and there are some of the stewardship teams, volunteer teams that only do non-chemical control and they can be very effective at it, but it requires a lot more persistence. Um, and then herbicides, you know, we, we want to use them in a very judicious way. We have every species on our website, you can find, look up any species and find what our recommendations are for treatment techniques. Um, and we also have an herbicide mixing table so you can get exactly right and not use too much herbicide. Um, so, you know, that could be very effective when done correctly. Um, yeah, so there's, there's different methods and ultimately we're all gonna re need to rely on ecological control through deer herd reduction. That's ultimately what's gonna get us into a much better place at this level of the state. So yeah, there's regulations. Obviously you wanna do it right. If you're gonna do it, you're gonna, you gotta do it right. Um, and even as a volunteer, you can work under uh, an applicator that's part of the landowner or municipality or, or whoever. 
but if you're going to use herbicides as a volunteer group, you know, you definitely have to make sure that the folks are trained. Um, and these are the types of herbicides that we use. Um, so, you know, there's, there's different things out there, a basic sort of subset of, of, of uh, herbicides that we use. You know, obviously safety is, is critical. Um, you know, and then you can get into the different methods and they all have pros and cons, you know, so if you're going to use foliar spray with a, a backpack sprayer, you know, you don't point up, you only point down four feet or lower, so it avoids drift and hurting things that you don't want to hurt. Um, you know, there's the cut stump method, which folks that are most tenuous about using herbicides, they feel if they're going to feel okay about it at all, which they might not, but cut stump is probably the most directed way to apply herbicide. But, you know, like the picture suggests, depending on how big the plant is, you got to do a lot of work but um, to cut the plant down and then you dab herbicide on the tip of the, of the cut stem. Um, obviously, if it's a smaller thing, it's easier. Um, you can cut it with a loppers or whatever, but uh, this is probably the most directed way to use herbicide. Not too far behind is basal bark applications where you spray on just on the outside of the bark and you use a special herbicide that can uh, seep through the bark and get into the plant. Uh, hack and squirt is pretty labor intensive, as you might imagine, using a hatchet, um, but also a technique that could work. Um, and then this is just the uh, our, uh, an example of our mixing table and the suggested uh, methods. So, you know, we might say, you know, uh, FS1 is what you should use on a particular species, and it's this percent of glyphosate, this percent of triclopyr. And there's a companion table to this that actually says number of ounces of each of the things to put in. Um, and yeah, you get the gist. So, you know, that's the herbicide component of it. Um, and again, I have probably too many species to go through in a lot of detail in each one. Um, but we could talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, I'll go through these somewhat quickly, just so we don't get hung up forever on a long group of species, but calorie pair um, is become extremely widespread in the Piedmont section of New Jersey, and it's definitely popping up in other parts of the state as well. Uh, you know, and, and this sort of goes to a point, I kind of want to use this to stop to make a point generally, is, wow, that's a beautiful plant. Look at all those flowers, that's amazing. So if I told you it invaded an entire field in the entire field, 20 acres was almost all calorie pear and in this time of year, they're all in flower, wouldn't that be great? That's beautiful, right? Why would, what's the problem? Well, it's the same problem as, as the autumn olive example I gave you. You know, it has flowers at one point of the year, it has fruit at one point of the year, um, animals need fruits and flowers and seeds the entire year to live. So it really doesn't help to take an area that should be diverse with lots of things and make it only one thing. Um, and, you know, emphasizing that, yes, I get it. It's a beautiful plant. My response to that in, um, don't want you to read it overly harsh, but, um, it's, it's more than us. It's more. It's not just about us, <laughs> you know. And and I think that's a common kind of human kind of thing. You know, we're thinking about us. Well, that's pretty. I'm I'm good. I don't really care about anything else. I think it looks pretty. That's amazing. So let's move on. You know, we, we have to sort of break the mindset where we're most interested in how we feel, as opposed to saying, "Hey, that is a serious blow to nature." Um, you know, there might be, you might replace that with 25, 30 other species, and maybe none of them are quite so beautiful as that. Well, you know, that's what keeps the biodiversity going. That's what keeps our native uh, birds going. So, you know, we have to sort of break that, um, you know, sort of with the general public who's not particularly aware of nature and how it works, 
we have to carry that message and say it isn't just about us and what looks nice. Um, we want functioning ecosystems. Um, so yeah, enough of that. But you get the gist that the reason most many of the um, invasive species we have are introduced because they were beautiful in one way or another. Um, so calorie pear has beautiful flowers. Um, Japanese Aurelia, I think this one was just a novelty, although it does have its, its merits. The flowers with the fruit forming in a ring like that is actually outstanding, but it is a thorny, nasty plant otherwise. Um, so it was more of a novelty. Um, but again, this was purposely introduced. Now, in some parts of the state, you know, uh, the northeastern part of the state in particular, uh, but all through Morris County, this is an extremely widespread invasive. If you go down to Hopewell, where I do a lot of work, it's still an emerging invasive species, and we we direct a lot of time at it. So, um, you know, it, it really does depend. If you're part of a volunteer, volunteer stewardship team, you would address this differently in different parts of the state, even though it's the same species. This is a harsh one. This one hurts because I really do love this plant. I mean, I think it's one of the most beautiful trees. It's just very... I don't know, it's just a beautiful tree, the architecture of it. Um, but, you know, it's becoming invasive. There's just kind of no two ways about it. Um, it's happening. And, you know, again, it's 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 um, same thing. It's not just about us. Um, we can't just be grading species on whether we like them personally or not. If they're going to disrupt the ecosystem, then we really shouldn't be purposely um, propagating them and, and buying them. Uh, Norway maple, I'll kind of go through some of these a little faster. Obviously, another one that's that's invasive and probably one that will respond more and more to climate change. Um, there's other ones out there like um, Seabolt's crab apple, which is uh, unique. Not, there's not another invasive crab apple uh, quite like this one. Um, you know, definitely an ornamental, you know, and then there's the oldies, you know, tree of heaven was the tree that grew in Brooklyn back when, um, Japanese honeysuckle was being noted as an invasive in the 1950s. People did note that there was a couple of tree of heaven around. And again, you know, within 50 years that had completely changed and it became a widespread invasive some shrub examples. Uh, common buckthorn is absolutely pe one people should that should be on people's radars. It's tall, shade tolerant. Um, so, you know, it has a lot of potential. We don't have shrubs in this category that are, are already very, very widespread. Um, so there's the, the characteristics of being tall and shade tolerant and be able to form thickets under a forest is, you know, an order of magnitude worse than like a barberry that maxes out at, say, six feet or so tall. So, you know, these are a whole brand new set of things that we need to worry about and try to squelch whenever we possibly can. So common buckthorn is definitely one that you should be thinking about. And again, we provide guidance on the best ways to treat them if this, if this is something you run across. Uh, glossy buckthorn is, could be a, a hellish problem, especially in wet areas. And the Great Swamp Invasive Strike Team, um, you know, they started on this one. And, you know, we found it at Great Swamp, which is one of the most magnificent natural areas in the state. And this species was just starting to get rolling and with further further uh, exploration, it was rolling very much. There was tons and tons of it. And that invasive strike team, they just knocked the living fudge out of it. They are the most persistent, most productive uh, volunteer team that I've ever come across. And they didn't look at this buckthorn as, wow, this is too big of a problem. They looked at it as, this is going to destroy our beloved Great Swamp. Um, and they just doggedly went after it, clearing acre after acre after acre of it. So again, it can be done. 
Um, you know, we've talked about Barberry a lot. Um, obviously, this is one that's a little bit more established, very established across the state. Um, but again, you know, time, think about time. This is only since the 80s or so that this started to become a major problem. Uh, jet bead, you can see why this would have been planted, big, beautiful white flowers. Um, it was on a slow creep for a very long time. And, you know, ultimately, um, it's, it seemed to be spreading more and more and more. And, you know, we're never going to eradicate this from the state, but, you know, we did a invasive species plan for White Lake natural area and found one area, one infested area. So what did we do? We killed it. You know, <laughs> let's protect the rest of the forest at White Lake and the forest surrounding White Lake from this obvious potential problem that could keep spreading and spreading. We we're not we didn't say at White Lake kill all of the barberry because that would have been unrealistic. But we said, well, shoot, kill all of the jet bead. You know that'll prevent a future problem. So again, it's just a way of looking at how to do invasive species control. Um, linden viburnum, unfortunately, is a widespread species now. Uh, when we started the strike team, I wasn't so sure, and then. Within several years, we had, I think, like 2,000 records of Linden viburnum across the state, and it was time to admit that it wasn't an emerging species. It was a widespread species. Um, but at the same time, if you have a site that's just starting to get some of it, that should be your priority. <clears throat> Multiflora rose um, was given away for free by the millions of seedlings by US Department of Agriculture in the 50s and 60s. Um, and as a living fence, which it does work for that purpose, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, obviously it's become a horrendous invasive species. Uh, interestingly, there's a disease called rose rosette disease that is greatly impacting it when it grows in full sun doesn't have, seems to have zero impact when it's growing in the shade though. But places like Hunterdon County, you, it's hard to find a field that has, is infested with rose anymore um, because the rose rosette disease has really whacked it back in open fields, but immediately adjacent forests unimpacted. So still lots of rose in the forest um, across the state. Botinia is another uh, tall, uh, shade tolerant uh, invasive species that is a very frightening guy. Um, absolutely one that should be controlled um, if you're just starting to see it pop up in a uh, land that you're interested in. Yeah, this is a bad one. Sea bulls viburnum is in that same group, tall shade tolerant shrubs. You can get the gist though, it's beautiful. You know, the berries have this cool sequence of ripening. Um, the flowers are pretty nice, but there's a lot of native viburnums that are just as nice. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, this is definitely one to worry about. There's a lot of it in Morris County in particular. And, you know, wing burning bush. So there's ex exceptions to every rule. If you have wing burning bush in your yard, and um, like I said, we do, we do a lot of work with private landowners. We have about 300 people in our community conservation program. There is, I don't think, a one of them that doesn't have some invasives in their yard. Not they, they may have planted it before they knew. The previous owner may have planted it, but just about everyone has some invasives in their yard. Um, but wing burning bush, if you have that, you do notice that deer do eat it, um, and it is one of the exceptions to the rule of uh, deer eating something that is quite invasive. But it, it has the ability to grow pretty quickly and get above the deer browse line. So it still successfully is an invasive, although it is a uh, exception to the rule that they deer eat it any, in any significant way. Um, but yeah, this is sort of, I wanted to throw in an exception in here as far as the deer browse. Uh, vines, English ivy is um, absolutely um, responding to climate change. If you go down the Cape May all the way up to places like Bordentown, uh, along the Delaware, you know, towards heading towards the middle of the state, you can find forests that are completely infested with English ivy. 
Now this wasn't an invasive, this has been used in landscaping, planted for hundreds of years at this point. And just in the last 20 or 30 or so years, it's starting to show how invasive it could be when the, when the climate warms. Um, so there's a category of plants uh, that are kind of creatively named climate sleepers. So these are species that they're in our landscapes now. We don't think of them as invasive. Other, you know, similar to English ivy was 20 or 30 years ago. We're like, oh, that's not invasive and it's beautiful. I love it. No big deal. Well, if maybe it needs another half a degree uh, of a growing season that's a couple of weeks longer on either end, and then all of a sudden it will become invasive. So there will be species that are climate sleepers and there's folks that have done research on this to sort of give us a heads up on which ones might be climate sleepers. But it's definitely something the strike team is, is thinking about. Um, we've talked about honeysuckle a lot. This is probably the oldest invasive in New Jersey. Um, Wisteria similarly seems to be getting more aggressive as it gets warmer. So beautiful. Again, the, we have to stop thinking it's just about ourselves. Beautiful. Who would not want that, right? That's gorgeous. But it is, when you get infestations of it, it just swallows a forest. There's no tree big enough that it can't strangle and kill. Um, so, you know, there's an American wisteria if you want that beauty uh, in your landscape. Mile a minute is, is certainly been quite aggressive. Uh, over the years, pretty unstoppable. The lesson I learned from this one is no matter how fast you try to be in early detecting and rapid responding, when you have a, a annual or a biennial, it's by the time you found it, it's already too late. So it's, it was a lesson learned to me that, you know, you could slow down shrubs and trees a lot better than you could slow down annuals and perennials, uh, annuals and biennials. Uh, bittersweet obviously is a significant problem uh, it has been so from about the 80s onward i've watched over my career uh, porcelain berry just absolutely explode and again maybe this is another um, climate sleeper kind of situation but it does significant harm um, just absolutely covers every tree, shrub, anything in its path and just swallows it up. It's, it's a very aggressive invader. <coughs> uh, winter creeper, also one to worry about. It's sort of in the same lines as um, English ivy, been around a while, just now starting to show itself as invasive. Uh, Chinese silvergrass uh, also definitely popping up more and more and more in grasslands and meadows across the state. Garlic mustard again. This is this was introduced in uh, you know by the colonists who brought it over from Europe, and um, you know it, it it didn't really become a widespread invasive until after deer had eliminated its competition in the forest. Knotweed um, is a serious problem, especially in streamside, riverside, but any other uh, disturbed areas as well. Very tough uh, to get rid of, but possible. And still grass also, you know, if you eliminate the shrub layer from a forest, still grass goes bonkers. When you get, add a shrub layer back to a forest, the still grass diminishes dramatically. So it's a matter of adding two layers of shade is the way to get rid of still grass. Um, uh, so yeah, once you have it, it's very hard to get rid of because it has a long-term seed bank, yada, yada, yada. The only real way to truly get rid of it is to have a shrub layer again so that it doesn't, um, it can't be so prolific. And mugwort is certainly on the move. Um, it seems to be spreading better and better by sea, just personal observation. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's it. And i um, happy to go through uh, questions. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it.
Um, and let's get started with the questions. What a great presentation. If you guys want to react with like a little confetti or um, any kind of, um, um, yeah, claps. <laughs> give, it, give it up for our presenter. Okay, great. So let's get into the questions. We kind of have a couple different sections of questions. Um, so we're gonna start off with just general questions about invasives. Does that sound good? Great. So um, can you say, all are all invasives bad? Yeah, I mean, if you're, the distinction is between native and non-native. You know, so not all non-native species are particularly troubling, but the, of those that are called invasive that meet that definition, yeah, by definition, all invasives are bad, but not all non-natives are. And okay, that's gotcha. definitely something, yeah, that's definitely a clarification that comes up a lot. So what would you say are the most damaging invasives in your experience so far? Um, yeah, it really depends on where you are and what habitats you're talking about. But, you know, I, I think that the ones that are most troubling to me are those very tall forest invaders, just if forest is your goal. Uh, so your common buckthorn and your oriental photinia and linden viburnum, Siebel's viburnum, you know, those, those are very troubling to me for forest habitats. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so when it comes to the widespread invasives that you work on, and you're talking about, you know, these ones that seem to be causing you the most trouble, how do you choose which widespread invasive to work on first? Like, how do you prioritize that list? Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing. You know, there's a couple of ways to look at. So you have a site and you say, how am I going to do invasive species management on this site? The first, to me, the first thing you do is you look for an emerging, any of the emerging invasives anywhere they are on my, on your site. And then you say to yourself, on this site, what are the best parts that are least invaded? You know, there might not be any that aren't invaded at all, but what are the least invaded areas? And let me keep those, let me make those free of invasives and make sure that new invasives don't come in. So you switch to a species point of view where it's like, whatever the most emerging thing is in the state, go after that. Then you find your best part of your park and keep it as good as, and um, improve it as much as you can and protect that. Then you can get more adventurous and say, well, okay, here's the good part of my property. I'm gonna go after whatever invasives there are along its perimeter and make it mm. bigger that way. So that's, that makes that's sense. Kind of yeah, that's sort of the, it, it, and it is really just, you know, there's a, a logic obviously to it, you know, um, you accomplish what you can accomplish. Don't die, don't take on a project that's so big you can't possibly finish it. Um, you know, it's, um, it was a very old song, accentuate the positive, like from the 40s or something, I don't remember. Yeah. That's the gist, is accentuate the positive and then move, move from there. Yeah, it's like establish a sanctuary where the natives can thrive and then those natives can be used, you know, against the invasives as you continue to spread across. Yeah, yeah. And then you could do, you know, you could you might unearth, you know, or find in your better part, you might find some bedraggled, chewed up, you know, wildflowers in the forest. Okay, we'll put a little deer exposure around them and let them start to flower and flourish so you know you could you can kind of um take that kind of approach amazing yeah it totally makes sense so when it comes to let's say someone who's not as aware of what invasive species are in their area like what would be the best resources that you would recommend for people to do research and learn about what's in their area yeah I, there's there's a decent amount of information on the web. I mean, the trail conference has a lot of um, fact sheets and things like that. Um, the strike team obviously has information. Um, you know, there, there's there's a fairly good amount of information. Penn State puts out a lot of information about control in particular. Um, you know, we try to put out links as they come up, you know, onto our, on our, our website. Um, but yeah, you know, 
Trail Conference, Penn State, Rutgers Cooperative, you know, there, there's certainly choices uh, for uh, finding information. Amazing. Yeah. And I think definitely familiarizing yourself with your natives can help you, you know, recognize what are the invasives. Um, we've definitely been into Jersey yards lately. Cool. Yeah, no, that, that's a great one. And and if, when you're out in the field, I, I mean, you know, I'm old enough to not care about social media and not be overly impressed with AI or whatever, but iNaturalist is an amazing app, in my opinion. And that will help you learn to identify anything from flowers to bugs to mammals, snakes, whatever. It, it's an amazing app with it uses AI and your location to suggest several possibilities when you take a picture. And then there's people that sort of monitor it, you know, that have knowledge about the steep the, the, these things. And they'll say, yeah, I agree with your uh, guess or I disagree with your guess. I think it's this other thing, but it, it is an amazing way to get into learning yet to identify species that never existed before. And it's it's well worth using as a tool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. We've heard of that before. I think other um, speakers have brought it up. Yeah. Um, so would you say like that is the one of the best ways, you know, um, Patricia's asking, how do ordinary people ID and catch those newcomer invasives? Obviously, it's all about prevention. Um, right. So. Well, I mean, the way it worked for me, you know, when we were first developing the strike team list, there was plenty of things I never heard of before. <laughs> Um, you know, we, we developed our list by basically, you know, knowing what we know, and then you go and you're like, well, then what's this thing? I've never <laughs> seen this before. Um, mm -hmm. and this was before I naturalist. So, you know, I'm like, well, I know a really good botanist. I'm going to ask him what it is. <laughs> um, but it's, a, it's the same way for any individual, you know, use I naturalist, you know, try to figure out what something is. Uh, you know, I, I like to play stump to chump too. You know, if someone sends me a picture, I will try to identify it if they can't figure out what it is. But you sort of build that sort of library of knowledge, starting with, well, I know what all these other things I'm looking at are, but what's this thing? You let yeah. iNaturalist get you in the ballpark and you'll, you might find out that it's, um, that it is an emerging invasive that you should absolutely get rid of, or it's a cool native that you never heard of before. Who knows? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So um, does the invasive strike force, Giselle is asking, have um, a, a space where we can report invasives to you guys? Yeah, so we have, um, we, we work under the EDMAPS system. So if you download the app EDMAPS, E-D-D-M-A-P-S, um, they, they've incorporated our custom list for New Jersey. So you, you download this app and you say, yes, I want New Jersey. And that's a customized list that the strike team has created. Um, so you could record um, what you see through that app. And I encourage people to do that. You know, you could also record through iNaturalist, but the this particular EdMaps app reports it in a way that we prefer. Like, you know, it gives an estimate of the population size in particular. Um, so yeah, you could use uh, EdMaps to um, you know, I, uh, to record observations. And there are people using it, like uh, Rich Rockwell is a volunteer extraordinaire. Um, and he has multiple sites that he's part of across the state. We're doing control work. And he uses it extensively to map where he's finding things and then also to keep track of control work that he's doing. So this is a database that's durable beyond individuals. And that's really important, you know, for ecology and, and, and other things when things might not change every 10 to 15, 20 years, things change and a person might not be there anymore. And you've lost all that knowledge. Mm -hmm. If you record your, your observations in a database that lasts forever, now people in the future will know what was happening. They'll be able to see the trends that were happening over time. So I, I definitely encourage people to use put observations into a database that's durable. Yeah, you know, it's all, I mean, you were talking earlier, the volunteer support is so necessary in these situations because it's all about our self-reporting and explaining it ourselves and what we're actually seeing on the ground, you know. And it, there's just no way for the strike team or 
every person in a conservation group throughout the state to be enough. <laughs> there, there has to be a ton of citizen science happening. Mm -hmm. Just too many things happening in too many places to rely on, you know, the folks that work for a conservation group. It has to be the general public has to be involved. Absolutely. Yeah. And let's, uh, we got to get the general public more involved and we're here yeah. to help, of course. Absolutely. Um, so I had a question. You were explaining a little bit about, um, you know, the different methods that you guys use, the strike team uses for, um, you know, getting rid of the invasives. So how does the strike team know which application is best for tackling each invasive? Are there like tests to obtain the knowledge or like how are those tests taken, et cetera? So when we, one of our um, technical group advisory committee is Art Gover from Penn State. And when we started, he does research. He had been, uh, he's retired now, but I, I can't imagine he's not still working in some way. Um, <laughs> but he, um, you know, they did, you know, very structured research on what works on what species, you know, what mm -hmm. herbicides work best. And when we set up our initial recommendations, they're almost purely for Mark Gover. And, you know, if we spice them up over time or tweak them a little bit, but you know they're they're based on experience, and you know no one wants to use an herbicide and have it not be effective. Mm -hmm. You know it's it's only grudgingly that you use them for most people. You don't want to. You feel like you have to. <laughs> um, yeah. But if you're going to do it, the biggest offense, in my opinion, is doing it wrong, applying an herbicide and not getting the effect of killing the invasive species. Mm -hmm. So you want it to work out. Um, I've seen, we do, we have a group of interns every year and it's just, you know, at this point it's almost humorous, but it's just like a human nature. They don't really want to use them either, mm -hmm. right? So the first thing they do is if you're spraying leaves of a plant, they don't put enough on. And I get the instinct, it's a good instinct, but if you don't put enough on, you put this herbicide out there and it didn't do anything. And that's mm -hmm. the worst possible offense. Mm -hmm. So when you use them, we want them to work. So that's why we have all of these types of application methods of different herbicides tailored to each species is we want, when we do it, we want to make sure it works. That totally makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a couple of people have asked some questions about like, you know, what herbicides are you spraying with? Um, yeah, that let's start with that one. I primarily use, it's a pretty, I mean, glyphosate and triclopyr are the two most common herbicides that we use. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are special cases where you use something else, like uh, if you're trying to finish off a population of kudzu, for example, you would use an herbicide called Milestone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, but yeah, the great majority of what we use is either glyphosate or triclopyr in, in some form or another. That makes um, sense. And is, would that end up, you know, even though it is on the invasive plant and, you know, you're using the right amount to make sure that invasive plant is getting, you know, knocked out, does this um, end up getting to be harmful to the beneficial insects of the area? Like, are they accidentally getting in, involved? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're trying to be use the most targeted method you can, right? So the first question I, I almost always get, not tonight, but usually is, does it get into the groundwater? And I could be very, very certain that, that, that it does not happen. Um, you know, you use the example of, I, I would use the example of Iowa. With all those millions of acres of corn fields being Roundup ready, genetically modified corn, getting sprayed multiple times per year, every year for several decades. If they were gonna show up in the groundwater, wow. I think we'd know. Yeah, what a place. Yeah, we, we've used it so much. Um, you know, I don't want to pick on poor Iowa, but, you know, <laughs> again, they've, they have more than their share of glyphosate sprayed in their state. Um, so, you know, again, it's if, if we're going to get in the groundwater, we'd know. Um, when every once in a while we get... Um, you know, scientists get real funny with themselves and try to find ways to make, put additives in gasoline. So we tried lead, that didn't work, that was stupid. 
you know, um, then we tried um, MTBE. And again, we're, there, the effort was to try to reduce pollution. Within two, three, four years, MTBE was showing up in groundwater. So, you know, when you look at glyphosate and say, well, it's been used for 40 years, you know, if it were going to get into groundwater, it would have been like MTBE. You would have known in several years, not several decades. Um, so it's pretty high level of confidence. Now, yes, does something, you know, and it's not persisted in the environment, so it doesn't bioaccumulate, it's not DDT, you know, um, if you, if there's a bug on a plant and you spray it, it's probably going to die, you know, and it's that, um, you know, you're making these hard decisions when you're out there, you say, well, you know, this base of plant that bugs can't eat is taking up space of a plant that a bug could eat. So the couple of bugs that happen to be, you know, perching on a barberry when you sprayed it and died, um, you're doing it for a reason. You're doing it because you want it to be a much better habitat moving forward in the future. So it's it's like um, medicine, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah, and you don't really want to take your cough medicine, but it's kind of in an ecological way, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, and then to to go on that metaphor to continue yeah. on, right? So like if let's say the bacteria in your system is the invasive species, right? And you are the native species because it's your body. Um, so does that medicine end up hurting the native species? But from what you're explaining, maybe I'm skipping ahead, from what you were explaining, if it's not getting into our groundwater, if it's not hurting those beneficial insects, is it hurting the native species? You're the invade the the argument in order to accept, say, I'm going to use herbicide. The underlying argument is that this is the lesser of two evils, that the damage being created by the invasive plant is greater than the one time use of herbicide in this particular location. And that that's the bottom line is. Um, you know, it's you're you're making the the argument that this is the lesser of two evils. Yeah. Um. So specifically, you know, you were talking about the the kudzu, kudzu. How do you say it again? Kudzu. Yeah. Kudzu. Um. And Patricia was asking in the south. You know, the Japanese climbing fern is end up becoming the new uh kudzu. Um. Do you have any um research of a strategy for like any herbicides that are being used against that? Against kudzu? Uh, no, the Japanese climbing fern oh, specifically. I don't, yeah. I don't know about that one. Um, that's interesting. Where where are they being observed? Um, it seems like the south of Jersey. Oh. But do you know anyone that might be researching that? I, I don't, and I'd love to know where this species is being found, like particularly, um, because it's something I haven't heard of, and this is how I learn about new things. Yeah, Patricia, <laughs> feel free to say more about it and so we can get more answer to your question. Thank you. Um, and so another question came up um, about the optimal time of invasive plants, like growth cycle. What, is there a best time to know like um, when, you know, to take it out, when to identify it, you know, in the growth cycle period? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as far as identification, obviously, it's easiest when the flat leaves are fully out and ideally you have a flower or a fruit to be an extra boost to you figuring it out. Um, you know, but it can be hard to figure things out until they're fully leafed out one. And then if they're leafed out and have a flower that really is about as good as you're gonna get to try identify something. Um, so flowers often help, um, not always necessary, but they often help quite a bit. Yeah, that makes sense. Visually, you'll be like, oh, wait, that definitely isn't right. <laughs> yeah, and flowers are, you know, that's the way they classify plants into families and things like that is by the morphology of the flower. So the, that the flower is actually more of a reliable character than a leaf or anything like that, um, as far as identifying things. That makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And then in terms of like an optimal time for removal, is it just like any time or? It, it varies by species. So, you know, typically 
you could, anytime a plant is leafed out, you could spray it the leaves. Uh, in the winter, most species, if it's a woody species, you can cut the stem and dab herbicide on it. Um, and um, so it really does depend on the species you're looking at. And, you know, you can treat it more or less any time of year, depending on the species, um, if it's woody. You know, for things that are really hard to kill, it becomes much more important on the timing. So Phragmites um, is a good example, or Chinese silvergrass, things that have massive root systems. You want to put the herbicide on the plant at a time when it's naturally moving, translocating sugars down to its roots. So August, September, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could spray the same amount of herbicide on Phragmites in June, and maybe you get I don't know, I'm, I'll make numbers up just to make the point, 70% yeah. kill rate. Mm -hmm. Do that in in August, towards the second half of August, maybe you get 95% kill rate. So for things that are hard to kill, the timing becomes important. For most things, it's not nearly as important, but um, there are few, some that you really do have to watch the timing of year. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, also, Sarah put in the chat, which I thought, you know, it's it's a great way that we're progressing in societies. You know, her historically herbicides uh, were used to kill native plants, considering them to be weeds. And now we're learning and changing our ways, saving our native plants and using herbicides to kill the imported in invasive species, which are once considered fashionable plants in people's yards and gardens. I it's do good. appreciate irony as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Using the weapons of war against the the ones that were brought in right right yeah there's there's everything is filled with irony that's for sure absolutely um, yeah it, it it's just a matter of value right i mean mm -hmm. if we say in, in in those victorian times the value was given i'm just harping on the same thing because i think it's important the value was given to that's beautiful or unique or interesting to me. <laughs> it is all about me. I want to be entertained. Entertain me, flower. Look beautiful. <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, it was about entertaining people. And now people are starting to get the just like, well, you know, the environment, the nature isn't just about me. I'm part of it. I'm not going to say I'm not part of nature. All humans are part of nature. But it's not just us, you know, so we're starting to value the native plants because we now we value the birds more. We value the pollinators mm -hmm. more. So we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. And speaking of birds and pollinators, this will be one of the last questions about um, just like specific. And then we're going to get into a little bit more about, you know, the laws and stuff you were talking about, if that's if that's good with you. Um, so how do the invasives actually affect our wildlife? Does the fruit offer nutrition? You know, obviously we're talking about the deer and overgrazing. Right. I mean, in a lot of cases, you know, the, uh, so I'll use barberry as a great example. So, you know, it replaces, depending on the type of forest, it, you know, it, it replaces spice bush in a lot of forests. So barberry, when you get down to the nutrition of the fruit, um, for a plant like spice bush that co-evolved with the species that are here, it ripens a fruit in late August into September that is bright red, birds love red, um, and filled with fat. So if I am a, a bird and I need to bulk up because I'm about to fly 1500 miles, I am going to eat as much fat as I possibly can to bulk up. Um, now, if you replace that with a barberry fruit, which has low nutritive value, very low nutritive value, and you, and, that, and you have to eat that because that's all there is because all the spice bush has been eaten by deer and replaced by barberry. So it's like, well, shoot, I'm either gonna eat nothing or barberry. I'll, I'll eat yeah. the barberry rather than nothing. But you know, you could, you could I don't know for sure. I can't, I try to be cautious sometimes when I'm, I'm a scientist, but I can imagine a bird gaining only 70% of what it needed to gain to make a successful migration because it had to eat barberry and not quite making it to its wintering ground or being in bad health and not be able to make it quite back up 
you know, when you say 30% of the bird population has been lost in the last 50 years, this has to be part of it. It's logical that it would be part of it. So, you know, and that's not an uncommon comparison where you have, you know, things that are weedy invasives, they're not the ones that are generous with what they give out. You know, their fruit is low quality. It's made to trick the bird to eating it. So it dis disperses its seed without the plant spending a lot of its own energy. So it's a weed, you know, more mm -hmm. weedy in, in the traditional sense of a weed. It's, it's about reproducing and spreading. Um, so it's not going to give up a lot of nutrients in its fruit. Yeah. So that, that's yeah, just like one example. That's just a one bunch example. of bags of chips but you're not going to get the same value if right. you're eating, you know, chickpeas, right. you know? Yeah, exactly. Exa yeah, it's not. And, you know, different times of year, birds need different things. So when they're raising their young in June, May, June, the fruits of plants that are co-evolved don't have a lot of fat. They have a lot of sugar. The birds are concentrating on eating bugs with protein to feed to their young. And they supplement it with sugar fruits like blueberries. Um, but later in the year, they're all trying to bulk up and there's sort of a pattern to the quality of native fruits based on, um, the bird's needs at the time of year that it ripens. So, you know, that all of that gets blown up when you throw a bunch of non-native species that are just taking up a lot of ground and they're not particularly co-evolved with the native uh, fauna. Yeah. Um, so can we get now where I was thinking this shift into a little bit more about the sale. Um, so what can people do to stop the sale of invasive species at nurseries? Um, how can we prevent them to stop importing them and stop landscapers from prevent um, from planting them? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would say that if if folks want to, um, you know, I'm not like a super experienced advocate in any way, but this legislation is out there and there all of our state representatives are going to be asked to vote on this at some time soon i would suggest write to your state representatives and say i support and and if you need the it's senate bill 2186 um so s2186 so you know that would be let your representative know that you're a constituent that thinks that this is important and thinks that they should vote to pass that bill. That totally makes sense. Can you tell us a little bit more actually about that invasive bill um, and what it's actually targeting, what it's saying, you know, in a, in a summary sense? Yeah, um, so it does list 30 species to start things off. Um, you know, our, our opinion was that's great, but there's way more than 30 invasive plants. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we want it to be much more comprehensive and we also want to be, you know, really forward thinking on this and say, okay, well, we should be thinking regionally, you know, um, from Virginia to Connecticut, you know, what's on their lists and we should give a lot of weight to putting, adding things to our list that our neighbors have. Mm -hmm. What are the climate sleepers? We should can seriously consider adding climate sleepers to our list um, to prevent future damage. So there'll be a New Jersey Invasive Species Council. Again, it was disbanded um, 12 or 10 years, 12 years ago, something like that. Anyway, something a wow. long time ago. Um, so this council would be existing, and one of their main responsibilities would be to do these evaluations and borrow knowledge and time and expertise from other states to add to our list. So those are, that's the, the main part of it. And, um, you know, um, there will be, you know, we've worked with the, the trade to make sure that um, they were satisfied with the phase out period, for example. So if you list the species and you're a nursery that grows them, you don't, you don't want to hurt them, you know? Yeah. So you basically want to say, okay, well, if you're growing them and that's important to you, let's give you a heads up for one, that a species might be getting listed. And when it is listed, you know, they told us that we'll stop propagating it within one year and we'll stop selling it within four. You know, so for example, a tree takes a fair amount of time from propagating it to selling it. So that st I'll stop making new ones in one year and I'll stop selling them in four years. That's what they wanted. Okay. 
you know, we're not trying to hurt you. We're just trying to make it so that invasives don't keep getting introduced on purpose into our, our natural areas. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, we don't want to hurt our local businesses, but starting these bills and getting them recognized all over the country will help us to phase it out entirely, you know, and it eventually just becomes the norm again, where native species are the ones that are available and cost effective and beautiful. And, you know, we, we restore that balance. I, um, I, it's, yeah, it's, go ahead. it's basically waiting to happen. You know, we, we have some really good native nurseries now you know, for sure, but it's still pretty limited, you know, in the scheme of, you know, it's a lot easier to go buy a barberry, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, our nursery trade in New Jersey is quite large um, and significant, you know, especially in South Jersey. Um, you know, they, they'd be making a wise business decision to consider selling natives. Absolutely. Um, so do you know, in terms of like, besides this bill, is there anything else being done at the state level to remove invasive species, such as paying jobs by the state to remove them? Yeah, it's, um, you know, the state um, in every department is short staffed. I mean, that's the long and short of it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot less state workers now than there used to be 20, 30 years ago. Um, and they really just, quite frankly, don't have the capacity to do a lot of significant amount of stewardship on their properties. It just doesn't exist. And it's sad. Um, but, you know, people would always ask me, like, oh, you must be part of the state. I'm like, no, no, we're a nonprofit. Like, oh, well, the state must give you money. I'm like, no, they've never given us a dime. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, um, people rightfully assume that the state should be doing something. And financially, but they they don't. And you know, getting this bill passed would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and in the scheme of things, it's cheap from their point of view. There's not a lot of cost to it from their from their end. Um, but you know, I, I think uh, if you want to fix our parks, you know, you can go to their website. I did a report for them last year, and it kind of outlines what the possibilities are to get more resources and have a more coordinated response on state lands. But um, Fix Our Parks is advocating for, for the hiring of more people at parks because it's tremendously understaffed. That absolutely makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, as we were saying earlier with the volunteers and citizen reporting and all of this, it's like, it's all of our responsibilities um, to make a difference. Um, it's just some of us can help to put it into law and make that difference permanent for all of us to contribute to. Um, right. So uh, another question we have, and we only have uh, four more questions left. So if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and hopefully we can get to them. Um, so on a national scale, uh, who educates policymakers on the importance of natives and the importance of prevention regarding invasives, given our need for a thriving economy for our national security? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure the Native Plant Society of New Jersey um, is involved. They are part of the team on the invasives bill. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure how much you know, and, and, and a couple of interesting things have happened native plant wise. So there's a Jersey native program that passed. Um, so that's been good. I, I know that the New Jersey Department of Agriculture applied for some grants for that because I wrote them a support letter, but I'm not sure if they got the grant or not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there's efforts like that, you know, so I mean, supporting things like that that are sort of in the works or, or existing already, but maybe fledgling. You know, I think that's, um, you know, a good handle. You know, it's like fully support the Jersey Native program. You know, it's something that exists. They, the, the state knows about it. They, they do it, but it, it could probably use more help. Absolutely. Um, so I have two questions specifically about um, such as uh, Route 80 and the Phragmites and the Oriental Bittersweet. Who do we end up contacting for state projects such as this where, you know, maybe it's not a space that volunteers can really access safely? You know, what, what, what would we do for that? I mean, you could, if you know who the landowner is, you know, as you're driving along, um, 
you know, you could reach out to whatever part of the state is in charge of managing it, but I can almost guarantee you the answer will be we don't have the funds or staff to address it. Yeah. I, I, so many people have come to me with that question in the past. And, you know, I tell, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes, it, I mean, the situation is so critically bad in a lot of ways where, you know, you say, well, I'm a volunteer. I'm, I'm just, I'm just asking you for permission to volunteer. Sometimes they don't even have the capacity to handle volunteers. Yeah. That, that's how overwhelmed they are. So, I mean, there, obviously that could be overcome and it has been in many places like those volunteer stewardship teams I'm telling you about and others that I don't even know about, but, you know, that's the, that is a huge part of the problem is that the state park system is severely understaffed. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they don't see it, I guess, as important as some other things that they can be funding, right? Yeah. And and you ask the park people and it's like, you know, we could barely keep the bathrooms open, you know, yeah. never mind going into the forest to kill invasives, you know. So the getting keeping the infrastructure moving is is um, you know, the minimal goal that they struggle to meet. Absolutely. Um, so one more question about laws. Um, so a lot of parking lots for commercial properties are planted with invasive species like burning bush, Japanese barberry, Chinese silvergrass, you know, the calorie pear tree. Is there, does this invasive bill um, help to, or just in general, will there ever be a way for them to be removed by law? Yeah, I mean, the, the listing is one thing, you know, listing them and saying these are now prohibited from sale the treatment of them on, you know, infestations that are out there now, you know, I'm not sure where that money will come from. You know, I think kind of like the questions you were asking before, if you say, okay, well, all right, state of New Jersey, the strike team and nonprofit will partner with you and we'll get a big old US Forest Service grant uh, from the federal government will give us money. You know, let's pick a park that's, mostly in good shape and keep it that way and make improvements to it. I think that would be the most bang for the buck, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, things like that can happen um, in partnership with nonprofits. I mean, it doesn't have to be the strike team. It could be a whole number of nonprofits, but, you know, partnering, the state partnering with other groups to get things done is probably the most realistic in the short term. Absolutely. Um... So last question for you on this fine evening. Thank you so much for your time. Um, what advice do you have for someone wanting to start a strike team anywhere in the nation, anywhere across the United States? Well, it just, um, you know, having that interest, picking the, the park of interest and, and getting that relationship with the landowner, the park superintendent or whoever, the, um, the environmental commission at a municipal park or something like that, or a green team or something like that. You know, kind of get that relationship going with the landowner um, and getting their buy-in on having you do work on the on that land and um, you know finding a few other like-minded people to get things rolling and then you know it could start building momentum. And I, I would absolutely recommend you know if you went to our 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 volunteer stewardship page on the strike team, you could talk to any of those people on the list. And they would have firsthand information about how they started. And, you know, that, that would be, I think that would be a really valuable way to uh, answer that question is, I could tell you what I just did, but more specifically, talk to all these other people that have actually gone through the experience to get something going and, um, you know, have them help you out with their direct experience. Absolutely. Uh, two of the really great suggestions um, are to start an invasive species removal Olympics and turn it into a sport. That's how we can get more people involved. And Patricia said, um, we need several mainstream horror movies about the subject of invasive species so that people know what's going on, you know, you and go. then it can inspire across the nation for all of us to start making our own strike teams. Strangling kudzu horror movie. There you go. <laughs> 
Well, Mike, thank you so, so much for all of the amazing insights. Thank you so much for your time and for this wonderful presentation. It's been super, super helpful. Um, and we're all very, very grateful for all the, the amazing things you do for our community to remove invasives. So thank you for the strike team and thank you to you for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. I'm going to pass it over to Carol, who will do our closing statements. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you, Mike, for a fantastic seminar. It's really intriguing to hear how in depth the problem is in our forests. And um, it's um, so disheartening that you, you're sort of battling it with your, you know, one hand behind your back, but we really appreciate what you're doing. Um, for the um, attendees tonight, um, we thank you for coming, and we want to remind you to check the chat box for the links to finding your local Wild Ones chapter if you want to join and become a member. Um, also, our New Jersey Gateway chapter YouTube channel, Facebook and Instagram links would be in there, and also a link to join our mailing list, our newsletter mailing list. Um, we do have a couple of events coming up in April for Earth Day, and, um, and they're going to be really fun events. It's going to be very focused on children. Um, April 15th at the North Bergen Braddock Park from 11 to 3. April 22nd at the New Jersey, I mean, I'm sorry, Jersey City Lincoln Park, 11 to 3. And then they'll be, we'll be at an event uh, on May 7, the wellness event in Dunellen. Um, it's in Middlesex County. We'll be at that event uh, from 11 to 3. Um, so we, if, if you're not ready, if you're not already a member, we would like to, you to consider becoming a member of the New Jersey Gateway to show your support of the work we're doing and spreading the word about native plants. Um, we're sort of not quite a full year yet into our term, um, but we're making great strides in imparting knowledge and information and um, your support would be so greatly appreciated. And with that, I wanna say thank you for coming and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.